celebrate the one week anniversary of the new IUBMB president, Alexandra Newton, I am going to talk about a topic that we both love, kinases and phosphorylation. So I'll go way into detail on all this stuff, but basically a kinase is a protein that acts to modify other proteins um, or other molecules, but I'm gonna talk mainly about the protein kinases. So what they do is they take a molecule of ATP. Yeah, see, I can't draw. This is why I do the computer graphics. But they take this molecule of ATP and then they take it to a protein and so this protein has already been made, so it's already been translated, and it's in this nice shape, and it's all happy and hanging out. And then the kinase helps activate that protein to attack the ATP. And so what the protein is going to do is going to, and it's going to take this ATP, and it's going to rip off this third phosphate group and stick it onto the protein. And so now, thanks to the kinase, the protein has this like phosphate group hanging on it. And I'll show you more in the pictures, but this phosphate group is this phosphorus and it's surrounded by oxygens. And this oxygens have this like negative charge. And so this phosphate group is this big, bulky, negatively charged thing. And the protein's like, dude, I was already all folded up. Like, seriously, you're going to come and put this big, bulky group on me? So then the protein has to change its shape and stuff to adapt. And this can change the activity of the protein. And it can also create new binding sites because now this protein has like it looks different and so another protein might come along and be like hey you're looking great can i hang out and binds so basically the phosphorylation can change the protein and the kinase does the phosphorylating so the kinase is like this protein changer whoopsie but then the phosphorylation can come off which is perfect because i was about to tell you about phosphatases which are other proteins that actually remove the phosphorylation so you have this reversible modification um, and it's a really great way to regulate proteins and regulate activity. You can have these like signaling cascades and stuff. So let's go into detail. Proteins are like the workhorses of your cells. And there's all sorts of proteins that can do all sorts of different things. And the recipes for making all of them are written in DNA in the form of genes. And then RNA copies of those called messenger RNAs are then used um, by protein making complexes called ribosomes to make the protein in a process called translation. So translation gives you the product exactly like it's written in that recipe. But that might not be the end of the story. So kind of like how you can add like a cherry on top of a cake or you can add icing and that sort of thing. There are changes that can be made to a protein that aren't specified in the genetic recipe and we call these post-translational modifications because they're happening after translation and probably the best example of post-translational modification is something called phosphorylation but there's also things called like glycosylation where you're dealing with addition of sugar chains um, as well as methylation and acetylation um, those involve the addition of different groups but what i want to tell you about is phosphorylation so a phosphor so phosphorylation is the addition of this phosphoryl group or we typically just refer to it as a, as a phosphate group um being added although technically it's only the phosphoryl part being added so it's being the phosphate at with the three of the oxygens but the phosphate or the phosphorus with three of the oxygens but the phosphate group itself is a phosphorus um, surrounded by three oxygen molecules and it has this negative charge and it's so it's big and bulky and it has this negative charge and this is um, important because it can cause a protein to like change so it's kind of like if you when you have a protein being made in translation you start off with just this long chain of amino acids so amino acids are protein letters and you get this long chain of amino acids that folds up to make a protein. But imagine now, the pro so the protein folding occurs because the protein, um, like all those amino acids are trying to find their like best partners. And so the protein wants to fold up so that it puts like the negatively charged things by positively charged things. It puts the, um, the parts that don't like water away from water. The, we call those parts hydrophobic and puts the parts that water likes near the water. We call those parts hydrophilic. Um, so you get this folded up protein that's folded ideally for the amino acids it has. 
And now you come along and you change one of the amino acids. So you don't change the underlying amino acid, but you add this phosphor phosphate group onto it. And you're adding, so your protein's all nicely folded, and now you add this negatively charged bulky group. And that's gonna mess things up. It's kind of like if you pack your suitcase like really, really well, and then you realize you have this big thing that you have to stuff in there. And so just as you might like shift things around in your suitcase, the protein might shift things around a bit. And we call this an allosteric change or a conformational change. So we call it a conformational change when the protein changes shape. And you can have allosteric effects is where like the phosphorylation in one site will affect the shape in a different part of the protein because there's kind of like this ripple effect. Like if you push aside one of the things in your suitcase and then it scrunches something on the other side. And these conformational changes can change the activity of the protein. Um, so that's one way that phosphorylation can impact protein structure. And this is in important um, because the molecules that actually put on these phosphate groups, is, they're called kinases, and they're actually often activated by other kinases. So a kinase will phosphorylate another kinase, and then that will activate that kinase. And this allows you to have these signaling cascades. So if you start with a signal from like outside the cell, that can lead to the activation of a kinase that is cell bound um, or membrane bound. And then that kinase, once activated, then it can activate other kinases. Um, and those can then activate other kinases and then they can activate other kinases. And ultimately you can phosphorylate all sorts of right, wide range of substrates. So a substrate is something that um, an enzyme acts on. And so a kinase is an enzyme and what that means is that it can speed up a biochemical reaction um, without getting used up itself. And so if you think of, um, like it doesn't change the beginning or the final products, it just makes the transition easier. So they lower what we call the activation barrier. So if you think of like a rainbow, we have a pot of gold on one side, um, but you have to get over the top of the rainbow and the top of the rainbow is really uncomfortable, the enzyme makes it th that rainbow shorter. And so often how this does it is by like stabilizing the transition state. So if you think of snapping a stick and how in the middle, when you're in the middle of snapping it, like right before it snaps, it's really like um, tense and stuff um, and uncomfortable. And so the enzyme makes that easier. And so I'm gonna show you how the kinase can make this easier, an easier transition. So let's um, look at what we're adding. So we're adding this phosphoryl group and we can add it in a few different places. So different kinases specialize in adding to different amino acids in different locations. So they'll often have like consensus sequences or like sequences they like um, to phosphorylate and then they'll phosphorylate within that um, they'll phosphorylate with somewhere within that sequence. And so, but they'll only phosphorylate on certain residues, um, so certain amino acids. Um, and so these are tyrosine, serine, or threonine. So typically you have like a serine, threonine, ty ty um, you have a kinase can, that can like phosphorylate serine and threonine, and a, phosph um, a kinase that can phosphate, uh, can phosphorylate tyrosine, and then you might have there are also kinases that can phosphorylate histidine sometimes, especially in like bacteria. And so we have our protein substrate and it has a, a phosphorylatable amino acid on it. So it has an OH group that can be have a phosphate group added onto it. And then we have ATP. So ATP is going to be the source of our phosphate group. So you might remember ATP, we talked about it before when we were talking about how it's used as a form of energy storage. But here, so because ATP is this form of energy storage, when we phosphorylate things, we can say it like takes energy. Um, so often phosphorylation of proteins is sometimes used as a sort of confirmation step or so, something like you're investing energy in this. Um, so you're like investing energy in a certain pathway and that might devote you to going down that pathway. You see the, that a lot in um, metabolism. So the making and breaking of molecules. 
So let's talk about how Akinase is going to help with this. So we talked about how enzymes can kind of stabilize that transition state. And the transition state here is going to involve some negatively charged, awkward ATP bent type thing above. And so since you have this negatively charged thing, you wanna help hold it in place and stabilize it. And so to do that, you can use positively charged things. And so kinases often use metal cations. So a cation is as a positively charged thing. So often kinases use magnesium um, cations, which have this plus two charge. They can help hold that phosphate, um, that ATP group in place. So now you need to somehow get that end phosphate group off. So we call that the, um, the gamma phosphate. And we need to remove this. Um, and so how do we do this? So it might not seem obvious because we've talked about how the phosphate group is negatively charged, but that's just the phosphate group overall is negatively charged. And it turns out that charge isn't shared fairly. So the reason why things are charged is because they have an imbalance of subatomic particles called protons and electrons. And so protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. So if you have an imbalance, you're gonna have a negative charge. So different atoms, so different elements like carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, they have different set numbers of protons. So an oxygen is always going to have eight, proton, eight um, protons, and a hydrogen is always going to have one, but they can have different numbers of electrons. And they have this ideal number that they want to get to, and so it's oversimplified here, but you can have like, there's like the shell model that helps explain things. And you, so you have this outer ring of valence electrons, and so atoms want to have that like full outer shell. Atoms form, can kind of join together and share pairs of electrons so that they can each get to their ideal number. And so when oxygen does this, oxygen is really um, what we call electronegative. It's a total hog. So even if it's supposed to be sharing electrons with something, it's going to pull them closer to it. So that oxygen is going to be more negative. Um, so we talk about, we, it looks like so electrons are these actual things, but they're not really in these rings, they're in this cloud. And so you can think of the cloud being the electron cloud, this negatively charged cloud, is hanging out more by the oxygen than what the oxygen is bound to. And so in the case of the phosphate group, what you have is this, phos um, this uh, phosphorus group surrounded by these oxygens. And so the oxygens are pulling the electrons away from the, phosphate, the phosphorus. And this makes the phosphorus positively, partly positively charged, even though it's surrounded by this negative charge and you might not think that it would be positively charged. And this makes it act as an electrophile. So an electrophile is something that, um, it wants something that's, na it wants more electrons. So it's like something often positively charged or partly positively charged. And then, we need to have, an, if we want to attack it, we can use the opposite. So we need something that has more electrons than they want. And so this would be what we call a nucleophile. So a nucleophile, it, it's nucleophilic. It's, it loves the nucleus because the nucleus is where there's positive stuff. So it's often negative. And so often what happens is you have like an, um, an O minus group is a really good nucleophile because it has these like lone pairs of electrons and it has um, so it has more electrons than it wants. So even oxygen, although it likes electrons, it doesn't like being negatively charged. Things don't really like having a negative charge. It's uncomfy. So the oxygen wants to be comfy. And so in order to do this, it wants to find someone to share those electrons with. So it's going to look for something electrophilic. And now let's go back to our kinase. So we have that phosphate that's electrophilic. But we need to get the, um, our substrate to want to attack it. So right now we have an OH group. So that's on like your serine, your threonine, or your tyrosine has this OH group. And an OH group is pretty happy. Um, it's not really, that oxygen's fine as it is. But an O minus group, remember, that's going to be really nucleophilic. So we need to turn it into an O minus group. So we need to steal that hydrogen. And so often this is, this is usually done with the help of um, 
an amino acid that's sticking out into the active pocket, so the place like where the stuff is going to happen. So there's often um, a basic amino acid that is going to pull off that proton, um, so pull off that H plus and leave the um, leave this O minus. And then that O minus can act as a nucleophile. So it's going to attack this gamma um, phosphate, breaking the gamma phosphate beta phosphate bond. So yeah, so we just, instead of numbering these, we use Greek letters, so alpha, beta, gamma. So the gamma one is the one that we're ripping off. And so when that O minus attacks the that bond is going to rip off the um, phosphate, but you get this awkward intermediate, so basically there's a little bit of a reshuffling that happens because you attack that end phosphate, um, that end phosphorus, um, but then that has too many bonds to it, so then it breaks off with the, um, the phosphate group next to it. And so you can see that you have an oxygen and it's attacking like this phosphorus. So you're taking three oxygens from that phosphorus, so that when we say we're adding a phosphate group, that's why we're actually adding a phosphoryl group, because we're at not adding the four O's, we're just adding three O's. But normally we just say we're adding phosphorus, like we say that um, a kinase adds a phosphate group. Um, and then at this point, um, you can then release the product. So you have a phosphorylated protein and then you have ADP. So now your protein might be changed um, and it can do different things. But this isn't necessarily a permanent change because there's also enzymes called phosphatases that can actually remove the phosphorylation. So you can have this kind of um, balance between phosphorylation and dephosphorylation and this helps you reversibly regulate molecules. Don't confuse kinases with phosphorylases. So phosphorylases can transfer inorganic phosphates to another molecule. So they can like um, put free floating, so this like orthophosphate, they can put that onto a substrate. But phosphatases, or kinases do it from organic phosphate. So th they do it from like ATP. And it's, we've talked, I've been talking about a protein kinase, but there's also kinases that can phosphorylate other things like sugars and that sort of thing. And that plays a key role. Um, going back to like metabolism, that plays a really key role. Um, phosphorylating intermediates in the pathways.